okay, via more than one scheme. So maybe by isomeric tr transition scheme um, and uh, by uh, giving off a gamma ray and also by giving rise to a, a beta particle, let's say. How do we produce them? Well, there are a lot of different ways. Some of the radionuclides uh, can be produced uh, via fission. Uh, molybdenum-99, which we then use as a generator for technetium-99M, uh, uh, is produced that way. So most of the molybdenum we get comes from nuclear power plants. Um, we can produce them via neutron bombardment. And, uh, <laughs> P32, P um, I125 are produced th this way. These guys all have excess neutrons and then therefore they tend to undergo uh, beta minus uh, decay. We can also produce them via cyclotron by bombarding atoms with protons, uh, deuterons, uh, alpha particles. Thallium-201, uh, gallium, uh, indium is another nice example. Uh, fluorine, F18 can be produced that way. And since these have excess protons, they tend to either decay by positron emission or by electron capture. Okay? In, in general, some of the smaller ones tend to undergo a little bit more positron emission. Some of the larger ones a bit more electron capture. That's just kind of a general rule of thumb. Radionuclides can also be produced in a generator, and that's how we get most of our technetium 99M. We, we get molybdenum 99, and as it decays, it decays to this. Um, and so uh, the, those technetium uh, 99M generators are a nice way to get that. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail when I talk about uh, technetium. And these, uh, these products can really end up decaying the parent to produce the daughter through a generator type phenomenon by any one of the ways that we just described. And he here's a nice summary of what we just talked about and the production of some of these from a table in, in Bushberg's book on medical imaging. So remember, radiopharmaceuticals. We now have this radioactive atom, but in nuclear medicine, we're really trying to image physiology, right, not just anatomy that we're doing in some of the x-ray imaging we looked at. So we have to take this uh, radioactive atom, this radionuclide that we've created, and we have to make a radiopharmaceutical from it. In other words, we have to do chemistry with it to get it to be part of uh, some biologically active drug, if you will. And I show the periodic table. We know all, how all, a lot of these things behave. But, but take a look at some of these things, like technetium, right? I mean, this is a, some of these are pretty good-sized metals. So how do, you, how do you chelate them to some other compound and still have it maintain its biologic activity? And there's a, there's a you know, ra the radiochemistry involved with doing that is a whole field into and of itself. So really, what would be the ideal characteristics for us in terms of a radiopharmaceutical? Well, you know, we'd really love to have something that has a relatively short half-life, right? That way, if it stayed in the body, it would decay fairly quickly and we wouldn't end up with a, a long-term exposure to that person and, and people around them. But you know, we don't want it too short. I mean, if the half-life is a matter of seconds, how do we get our imaging done that we want, want to get done? We really would love monochromatic gamma ray production, right? And we'd love the energy of those gamma rays to be sufficient enough that they escape the body, right? That the body doesn't absorb them all because there's such low energy and the dose is just all deposited in the body. But we'd like the energy to be low enough that we can actually do a decent job stopping them with our camera or our detector. We'd love them to have minimal production of particulate radiation, such as those beta particles, or in creation of those internal conversion or OJ electrons. And we'd love for the, to, that radiopharmaceutical to lo localize itself at that organ of interest, be relatively non-toxic, have high radionuclide, radiochemical, and chemical purity. And of course, we'd love it to be inexpensive and readily available. Boy, that's a pipe dream, right? But th those are the properties we'd love to have. The localization of those radiopharmaceuticals, well, there are many different ones that we have, and, and I just jotted down some of those, right? Sometimes we're looking at compartmental localization, like in a GI bleeding study, where we're just going to label red blood cells and see whether they stay in 
the bloodstream as opposed to dumping into the, the gastrointestinal tract. Sometimes we're just imaging simple exchange or diffusion, and this is true in radionuclide bone scanning with uh, MDP, where we're really looking at exchange of that uh, with the, the bone, or in ventil ventilation imaging with labeled gas. Sometimes we're imaging phagocytosis with a, a sulfur colloid or capillary blockade when we're imaging using uh, labeled microaggregated albumin or, or cell sequestration or, frankly, metabolism when we're imaging with some of the, the glucose analogs like in uh, F18, um, FDG PET imaging. You know, technetium 99M as a, a radionuclide comes really close to some of the properties that we, we talked about. Uh, it's, and that's why you see it used in various labeled forms to perform greater than 80% of the non-PET nuclear studies. It decays with 88% of its nuclear transformation resulting in the emission of 140 KeV, about 140.5, 141 KeV photon, which is great, right? That's ideal escapes the body like we talked about, still low enough that we can stop it fairly readily. Unfortunately, the remaining 12% results in these uh, energetic electrons and deposits dose in the patient, but that's a relatively small amount. And for that reason, there's been a lot of chemistry uh, does, de uh, developed around technetium. The other thing that's nice about technetium is we can really get technetium fairly readily using a molybdenum generator. So here's a alumina absorbed with molybdenum, and as it decays, some of that decays to technetium, it becomes water soluble in that. And so here's a sterilized solution of saline connected through that column via this tubing. And if you popped an evacuated vial onto the little uh, needle, if you will, on the top of this, it would suck that fluid past that column, taking off the soluble technetium, and you'd end up with technetium in your vial. And Hopefully it was working well and you ended up with very minimal amount of breakthrough of molybdenum in your vial there. How many people still get a technetium generator like this delivered to their hospital here? So there's some, you know, more and more it's becoming, doses are becoming available if you especially live in a, a fairly well populated metropolitan area where you can have your technetium delivered to you on a per dose basis. You tell them what time your study is going to occur, they will send you the unit dose that you need such that at that p time it would have decayed to exactly what you needed, needed it to be. Um, but some places still have their generator that they use e each day. And if you have the generator, one of the things that you know that's really nice about it is if you start off with 